There is a garden, there is a city, and there's a kingdom of God. And it is beautiful, and he is bringing it right now into our midst. So today I was heading into the office, took a slightly different path, wanted to see the countryside a little bit. And at one point you get to this uh, one lane underpass. You have to wait a minute and then you can go. So light turns green, I go down, it's in this little swale. Take a sharp right and then you take a left and to head over. And then there it is, road closed. And it's very closed. Leadership is like this sometimes, it's messy. Sometimes you're on the road, you're on the path, and you find there's water rushing over it. And you have to decide, do I go across it or do I turn back? And so for a split second, I thought, maybe I can make it across. And then I humbled myself and said, there's no way. So I had to do what was the right thing to do. I had to back up. I had to turn around, I had to find a different way to go. I really didn't know where I was going, and so what I had to do was I had to humble myself, I had to pull over, and I had to look at a map. This is sort of the picture of messy leadership, where you get to a place in the road where the sign says, high water, danger, and you have to decide, do I turn to the left? Do I turn to the right or do I go backward? Okay, how many of you got an elbow in your side right then? <laughs> I bet some of you did because some of you were like, go through it, Brian, go through it, right? Go through the water. All right, hey, first I wanna uh, welcome those of you who are uh, in the Life Center, uh, welcome. And for those of you on live stream, we're glad you're with us as well. Hey, one other quick uh, announcement for all of us today. Uh, baptisms today at three o'clock, we think the weather is gonna hold, okay? So uh, check out in the Next Steps area right out, out here, and they'll give you information about getting there and everything. Check on the website after one o'clock in case something gets changed or canceled or postponed, okay? So we are in uh, week three of our series on conversations and leadership. And I want to start with a, another little story that happened that I just remembered before first service it has to do with the other Brian and myself. Uh, I was here, Susie and I were here in January and we interviewed with the elders, the board and about me coming on staff and they agreed, hey, we're going we're gonna to have Brian Newman come on staff which was great. We get out to our car, it's in the evening, and uh, Brian and I are gonna go grab a bite to eat or something. So he says, follow me. Okay, I'll follow you. You're my leader, I'll follow you. So he gets in his car, I get in my rental car. By, by the way, Brian Rice has a car that looks like a lot of other people's cars. <laughs> I'm just saying. So he says, follow me. So I thought that he pulled out and went one way, so I followed him onto Bell Drive and down. Well, five minutes later, I get a phone call. He's like, Brian, where are you? I'm following you. No, you're not. You, went, you followed a different car. So he said, ah, this isn't starting out so well. So. Well, today's about messy leadership. And that video showed it, and that story shows it a little bit. And uh, we'd like to focus in on uh, one specific uh, passage, Hebrews chapter 13. Before we do that, I want to do a little bit of a review. I think it's just helpful for us uh, as we consider the last couple of weeks. So uh, week one was about good leadership, God's design for leadership. And we said that the purpose of good leadership is for flourishing of people, for the flourishing of people. And we also said that the, the nature of leadership is always about loving others. It's about the other. And then lastly, we talked about how God is the source of all good leadership. That was week one. And it was embedded in the creation, how God created the world. And then week two, as Brian spoke last week, we talked about what's gone wrong, what's gone very, very wrong. And all of those purpose, nature, source get corrupted in the fall and with sin. And so we talked about bad le leadership is about self. And it's about advancing self or protecting oneself. It's always about the leader and not about people who are following him or her. 
And then the second is about nature, and that bad, bad leadership uses others, where good leadership always loves others, bad leadership uses others. And then lastly, we talked about how uh, there are counterfeit gods, that the source of bad leadership is always things like money, sex, power, pride, stagnation, different dysfunctions. And so that's where we've been the last couple of weeks. And you know, last week, as I was, as I was listening and just pondering this, it's sober. It is sober to consider bad leadership. But, but we have to in this series on conversations on leadership because it's, it's crucial that we understand the good and the bad of it. And so this week, we move on and we're, we're talking about the, the implications of living in the midst of good and bad leadership. And so here's the verse. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 says this in these two verses. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what we're looking at today. We're going to do two things. One, we're going to con consider the idea of remembering what do we remember? What are we called to remember? And there are actually three areas of our life that we're called to remember. And then second is, how do we remember and how do we think of our leaders? And if we're a leader, how do people think of us? And so three ways to, to remember. One area, the first area is this. All throughout the Old Testament, especially in the first five books of the Bible, the Israelites are called to remember God and to remember where they've been. Here's an example of it. Numbers chapter 15. If you ever wonder, if you ever see a Jewish person wearing a prayer shawl, it's called a talis in, in Hebrew. You ever wonder why do, why do they wear that? Here's the answer. Speak to the Israelites, God says to Moses, and say to them, throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corner of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at so you will remember all the commands of the Lord that you may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by chasing after the lusts of your own hearts and eyes. Then you will remember to obey all my commands and be consecrated to your God. See, we have a tendency, the Israelites did and we do also, to forget God. So actually that prayer shawl is a reminder to people to say, oh yeah, I, I am called by God to obey him and to follow him. That, that's why we wear that, for no other reason. Think about this. The book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, the purpose of the book is to retell the story of God and what he has done and how he has done it for the Israelites. Here's one example. I could list many of them. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Over and over again in Deuteronomy, we're retold the story from creation all the way up to what was the present then of how God had redeemed his people and cared for his people and disciplined his people and, and sometimes put them out and didn't allow them to, to enter the land. All of that, the whole book is about our call to remember. And so part of our faith journey in following Jesus is to remember who God is and what he has done for us. That's the first kind of remembering that we're called to. But here's, a, here's another. Edmund Burke said these words, you're probably familiar with them, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. You know, we must be historians in a sense, whether we read a lot or not, whether we watch on video or whatever, we must know our history. Why? Because if you don't know your history, you don't remember your history, you say that's never happened or that can never happen and then it does. And then we repeat it. I'll give you an example of this. I just thought about this in the last couple of weeks because my wife and I were driving from here down to North Carolina to visit our daughter and son-in-law and uh, went through Petersburg, Virginia. Eight of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War happened in a 200-mile mi radius from here to P Petersburg. 200,000 people died on these battlefields. It is not the entirety of the casualty list. There's probably another 100,000 men who died in this little strip of land in a three-year period. That's half the number of people who died in all of the Civil War. Man, that, that is staggering. 
Now, we live close enough to Gettysburg that we can be reminded of this more, more often than not. But there is something about learning history and studying history and, and being a student of that, whether it's U.S. history or world history or whatever, that gives us one word, and this is important, perspective. Perspective. The difference between a good leader and a great leader is bit more and better perspective. Great leaders have great perspective about how they are leading now and what's come before him or her. And, and how, whether it be this, this uh, company that you're, you're leading or this uh, government context or church context, understanding one's history gives perspective for the, the present. And so this example from the Civil War is a stark one. So I would encourage us, as we consider leadership, whether you're a leader or whether you follow a leader, study history. And you think, oh, I don't read that many books. Okay, well, there are some great histories that, are, that you can find online, that you can find in video. Uh, Band of Brothers, uh, just a brilliant, brilliant per perspective on World War II. Now, it is one perspective. It's not the only perspective. Or a show like American Experience that has lots of different ways to, to access history. So I would just encourage that. That's the second way that we are to remember. And then there's a third way. I would be remiss as a pastor if I didn't mention this. Miroslav Volf is a Croatian theologian. He's written many books. One of them is called The End of Memory, and it's actually kind of a personal memoir for him. He is Croatian. He lived in Yugoslavia when Yugoslavia blew apart and they had a civil war, and there was virtual genocide on all sides of this. And so he has this painful, painful remembrance of growing up and being in the midst of that. In a room this size, five minutes ago when I talked about our call to remember, if you were honest with yourself in your heart, you remembered something that was horribly painful. And perhaps, you spend a lot of time trying not to remember that. That's just reality. That's the reality of the broken, sinful world we live in. That bad things happen and then we have memories of them. Listen to Wolf's perspective on this. He says, to remember a wrongdoing is to struggle against it. That's a powerful statement, especially from somebody like him. Learning to remember well is one key to redeeming the past. And the redemption of the past is itself nestled in the broader story of God's restoration of our broken world to wholeness. Now, I can't unpack all of that here. And we, it would be very difficult to have a counseling session with 1,800 of us here. But it's very, very important that we do address this that we find a way and ways that God wants us to find to place our memories, good and bad, by the way, in the right context. And that may take sitting with, with a counselor or in a support group or with a, a, a small group or something like that that helps with that. Now, that's especially the case with bad memories. Uh, there are also really, really good memories that are much easier. And I'll share one right now. Uh, my wife Susie and I became grandparents two days ago, which is a phenomenal memory for us. So this is our first time being grandparents. Uh, Carly and Peter are our kids, and they had a little girl named Juniper. They call her Junie. So I got to hold my granddaughter yesterday, which was pretty amazing, pretty awesome. So we have all sorts of we have all sorts of memories, and I, I want to I want to honor the fact that they are, in our messy, mixed-up world, very diverse. There are beautiful, beautiful memories and remembrances we have, and there are very, very painful ones that we have. And we are to remember all of them and find a place for all of them. So th these are the three areas of remembrance. So one is sort of our faith remembrance and how we remember what God has done. Second is history, remembering history, which gives us perspective. And then third is about our personal perspective. And so we're back to this. 
How do we remember our leaders? The verse that I read in Hebrews chapter 13 says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. So I want you to notice that, that the writer is talking about remembering our religious leaders, our church leaders, our people of faith, it says, who spoke the word of God to you. So how do we do that? What are we called to do? And in this messy, mixed up place of leadership, where there is good leadership and bad leadership, what does it mean, what does it look like to remember our leaders? Well, there's two things. One, it says, consider the outcome of their way of life. Consider is kind of a weak word here, okay? It, it's better to think about to contemplate or evaluate or scrutinize, to think deeply about our leaders. Not just to sort of take them at face value. To think deeply and to evaluate and scrutinize what? The outcome of their way of life the results of their life, the fruit of their life and ministry, or in a word, their legacy, their legacy. That's what we are to do. Now, if you are a leader here in whatever context, people are called to do that with you also as a leader, which quite honestly scares me to pieces. Because as, as a leader, that is how we are quote unquote judged. That's how we're evaluated on the fruit of our lives and the fruit of our ministry, the, what lasts, the legacy. You know, I really didn't want to put this up here. And actually, I spoke with Brian about it. I spoke with Aaron about it. I really wrestled with this. And I did for a couple reasons. First of all, I do not come from a Catholic tradition. I, I have been helped by a number of, of Catholic theologians, and I'm very grateful for that. But I am very remiss and very, I'm very slow to throw stones or anything like that. So please hear my heart in this. But it's been in the news and it is very, very large in the news. And it's very large in this state in the news. There are headlines from newspapers that we could not put up here because they're too graphic. You know, Os Guinness has this uh, phrase of unspeakable evil. And that's what went through my head and heart this week. You know, there, there are just, there are things that happened that just break your heart. They're just horrible. And remember what we said the last couple of weeks that Brian said, good leadership, there's really, really good fruit. There are powerful things that happen. And bad leadership, there's bad fruit. And it's very very bad. It's terrible. It's heartbreaking. It destroys people. It is so painful. And so this is part of the legacy. This is part of evaluating the outcome of our lives. And I would be the first to admit and to say this is terribly sobering. And I have prayed and we should pray over and over and over again, especially for the hundreds of victims of this abuse. It, it's a sobering reminder to us. Just as last week we looked at a, a, a pastor who had messed up pretty badly in a very large church in America, and, and now this comes out. And it's almost like it's a prophetic word in the midst of this series we're doing about conversations on leadership to see how broken it can be and, and how hard this is. And we are called, we as Living Word Community Church, we are called to consider the outcome of the lives of our leaders. And if we are a leader, whether it be in the church or in a business context or government or teaching or whatever, we live by that standard as well. You evaluate the outcome of my life as a pastor and you should and you must. That's what we're called to. And then secondly, we're told, how do we remember our leaders? We imitate their faith. Now this is a reference back to two chapters earlier, Hebrews chapter 11, that starts like this. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. The ancients were commended for their faith. Okay, here's some of the ancients. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab. This afternoon, read through Hebrews chapter 11. The, the hall of faith, we call it. 
and listen to these stories. They're glowing stories about these people's faith. And the writer to the Hebrews was inspired only to write about their faith, but not so much about the rest of their life. And that's important. You know why? Well, Noah, Noah built an ark. He obeyed God. He built an ark, and he was on the ark with all the animals and people. But you don't want to read after the ark situation. His life didn't end very well. Or you have somebody like David. David, who was his entire life called a man after God's own heart. We're, we're told that over and over again. But from 2 Samuel chapter 12 onward, after he commits adultery with Bathsheba, his life spirals out of control. Spirals. So the, the writer to the Hebrews is a critical realist. And he says, don't, don't you know, evaluate their lives. Evaluate their life. Scrutinize their life. Imitate their faith. The, the Greek is to mimic. That's where we get the word mimic from. Mimic their faith. Remember, remember your leaders and their lives and mimic their faith. What is their faith? Well, their trust in God, that God is sovereign and God is always good and God is faithful and God forgives. Imitate that. A.W. Tozer, uh, a great theologian, uh, made this statement about people in general. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Let me make it more personal about leaders. What comes into the mind and heart of a leader is the most important thing about that leader. What comes into their mind about God at any given moment is the most important thing about that leader. If you're a leader in whatever context, by the way, it doesn't have to be just in the church context, what comes into your mind and heart about God is the most important thing about you. And God, God is good. God is Father. God is trustworthy. God forgives sin. God redeems the most broken of broken. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And just as if we, we, maybe we didn't get it all, the writer ends with this. He says, okay, this is how you are to remember your leaders. Scrutinize, evaluate, imitate their faith. Remember that. And then he says this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He makes this declarative statement. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's almost like the writer is saying, look, you're going to evaluate all these leaders' lives, and there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. To think back on the little silly video we did on me driving in the water and stuff, sometimes leaders make the wrong decision and drive into the water. And then people follow them and they get hurt. But, but remember that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, if you, if, if you want to just say one verse over and over again in your life, this is a pretty good one. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is about trustworthiness. It's about faithfulness. It's about God being and doing who he says he is and doing what he says he will do. And, and the writer to Hebrews, it's almost like he feels the tension and the messiness that he just brought up when he says, hey, consider the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. And yeah, this is a little bit messy. Like, you have to really think about this. But, but remember this. Remember this. Jesus Christ is always there. Always. Without a doubt. That is what is most important. And in this series on leadership, we're kind of making a turn now. In the next several weeks, we're talking about the Jesus way of leadership, which I can't wait for that because that's what's most important. That's the kind of leadership we're called to, the way of Jesus. I can spend a lot of time talking about bad leadership, and we all can give you illustrations, whether it be on a personal level, in, in our work context, or from the news or whatever. And there's a place for that. <clears throat> but there's also a place to look at and look for good leadership, and when you see it, you celebrate it. Because it is something of a reflection of God's grace and goodness. So I want to give you a context for that. I want to give you a real story. I have to give you the context for it first. <clears throat> I am a baseball umpire. 
Okay, I know, I know. Everybody's gonna wanna talk to me about the bad calls they've seen, all right? <laughs> I've umpired baseball for a bunch of years. I know everybody has thoughts, feelings about umpires. I, I tell you this only because it's a context. Uh, I was umpiring a baseball game on this field about two months ago. It's in Colorado, and it's on the field of one of the best teams in the state. It was a junior varsity game. And it was quite a, a powerful time, and I'll tell you why. Now you know, if you have been involved with high school sports at all, that especially in good programs, it's very competitive. In Colorado, you're allowed 14 people on your baseball team in junior varsity and varsity. No more than that. 14 people can be in uniform. And you know what? They are the best players that that school can find. Isn't that the case? And if there's somebody who's not that good, guess what? Parents get upset, don't they? Right? We've all been there. So that's the context for this. Game starts, and I look over, and there's one boy who's in uniform, who's on the team, who clearly is unable to compete. His hand is, is like this. It doesn't really move. He can't run. He kind of drags his right leg. I find out later that his name is Jordan, and when he was 13 years old, he had a brain aneurysm or a brain bleed or something that left him unable to compete. He was a star football player, baseball tra player, track runner. He was very, very good. And here was this boy that he was unable to compete, but he was on this team. And I, I know the coach a little bit. He's a young guy by the name of Steve, and I've umpired him a few times. Really nice guy. And so the game went on, and uh, it, was a, it was a great game. And uh, I think toward the end of the game, his team was winning. And, I knew that this boy uh, could not compete, and I knew that he had been on the team all year and had not competed all year, because he's unable to. The seventh inning comes, and Steve goes to my partner and says, hey, I'm putting a substitute in left field. And there goes Jordan. He kind of almost sort of gallops out. I mean, he's very slow, and everybody is waiting for him to get out there. He gets out to left field. I'm standing behind second base or at, in front of second base, and there's two outs, and wouldn't you know it, there's a fly ball to left field. And I watch as Jordan gets his body underneath this ball, and he has his glove on this hand, and he, he's holding his arm with his other hand because he can't steady himself. And he reaches out, and that ball comes, and he catches the ball. And in that moment, it's like the world froze. And then his teammates just surrounded him and just cheered. And the other team cheered. And the fans cheered. And as I stood there with my sunglasses on, with tears welling up, I looked over and I saw Coach Steve on the sideline with his hands raised high, waiting for Jordan to come in and be embraced by his coach. And that boy got himself, got himself in, and that coach just grabbed him and hugged him. Friends, that is leadership. Let's pray together. I'd just like to take a moment and ask you to be quiet with your thoughts and maybe with a prayer. Exhale <laughs> as I need to. God, we thank you for stories like that, that, that somehow capture your absolute goodness. There's something pure and right and redemptive about it. It's lived grace. God, thank you that you show us those glimpses. In the midst of the messiness of leadership, 
you show us those pictures. And I know that others in this room have those stories as well. And we thank you for good leadership. We thank you most especially that that good leadership comes from you and comes from Jesus because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the source of all of that good leadership. And I thank you for that coach who had the guts to, to have Jordan on his team and probably to put up with some grief around that. God, I pray that we would be a church of leaders and followers who would live into those stories that you're making of the Jordans of the world, the good leadership. Father, we thank you uh, that you are always good. We thank you that you are about redemption and about forgiveness. We honor you. We praise you. Amen. Amen.